Welcome to Podcasts on Demand, a continuing medical education activity. This activity includes the most recent and current clinical data presented by leading experts. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the disclosures and the requirements for a successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the podcast description that can direct you to this information. Hi, I'd like to welcome you all to our CME lecture series for neurofibromatosis type 1 plexiform neurofibromas. My name is Amy Armstrong, and I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at Washington University School of Medicine. I'm a pediatric oncologist. I am the head of our solid tumor program and the co-chair of our adolescent and young adult sarcoma program, and definitely have some experience and interest within NF1PN. Here are my disclosures. The learning objectives for today's library series are to be able to recognize the burden of NF1 plexiform neurofibromas, or PNs, and examine updated strategies to improve diagnosis and subsequent monitoring. We hope to be able to evaluate practice changing evidence on available and emerging therapies for the treatment of NF1 PM, and to identify best practice approaches to integrate recent progress and improve outcomes for diverse patients with NF1 PNs who have distinct needs. For the beginning of the program, we'll go through an overview of NF1 PM, but we'll also hit these other bullet points as we move along, including updates in diagnosis and monitoring, treatment options for NF1 PM, recent practice changing evidence, and then clinical case scenarios to integrate new developments, which sometimes can be the most helpful. NF1 or neurofibromatosis type 1 is one of a few different neurofibromatoses that's caused by a distinct genetic mutation in the NF1 gene. It impacts about 1 in 2,500 or 1 in 3,000 live births with an equal distribution between genders. The cumulative risk of malignancy is 20 to 30 percent, which develops by the age of 50 in patients who have NF1. It's also, also the most common tumor predisposition syndrome. Additional neurofibromatosis um, conditions include uh, Legia syndrome, NF2 schwannomatosis, and then schwannomatosis, not otherwise specified, or 22Q related, but other genes are impacted within those uh, disorders. NF1 in general is an autosomal dominant tumor predisposition syndrome, meaning if a parent has the mutation within NF1, there's a 50% chance that the child will inherit it. Heterozygous mutations within the NF1 genes exist in chromosome 17Q11.2, and it um, involves 100% penetrance. So every patient who has a pathogenic mutation will ultimately shows signs of NF1. What's interesting, though, is that you can have de novo mutations or be the first in your family to have NF1. It carries about a 50% risk of having a de novo versus an actual family history where it was genetically inherited. And then the clinical issues or problems for patients who have NF1 very much varies from one patient to the next, and even amongst families um, who have the same genetic defect. So when is genetic testing actually indicated um, to make the diagnosis of NF1? Well, I'll tell you that the vast majority of cases can be made just based on clinical criteria, which we'll review in a few slides. The potential use for genetic testing is done for unusual cases or for patients who are a bit older and don't have a clear diagnosis or don't have the manifestations that we typically see throughout NF1. If it informs therapy decisions, if there are other differential diagnoses that are included, or for parents who are thinking about conceiving and debating prenatal testing. Additionally, there's really a limited genotype phenotype correlation. So even if you do have a mutation within NF1, uh, the NF1 gene, we can't tell you exactly what clinical manifestations you're gonna develop throughout the lifetime. And here's a really nice pictorial representation of as a child ages from birth to adulthood, what are different things that we'll see within the context of NF1? So at birth or in young infancy, a couple months of life, it's common to start to detect caffeolae macules, one of the most common things that we'll see in NF1, but also some of the bony dysplasias if they um, actually exist within the patient, being orbital, tibial, or pseudoarthritis. Additionally, plexiform neurofibromas are thought to be more congenital tumors that develop so very early within life, and they evolve as a, as a patient ages. And then as the um, you know, birth to infancy, um, as that child actually starts to go into childhood, four, five, six, you might start to see some learning um, deficits that may manifest. 
Also, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit disorder, in addition to autism spectrum disorder are seen within the context of NF1, as well as motor and speech delays. Optic pathway glioma is additionally um, developed in younger children. A lot of children will be screened for this at their um, routine NF1 evaluations, uh, mainly the learning deficits and other delays. So we can make sure that the right tools are in place to optimize the care for that child at home and at school. And then when you get to later childhood, earlier adolescence, you'll start to definitely see the skin fold freckling, leash nodules, scoliosis, in addition to some other neurofibromas, dermal and paraspinal. Really, the dermal neurofibromas we'll show some pictures of in a little bit really come about in later adulthood as well. And then the brainstem gliomas can be seen. Then lastly, in adulthood, some of the higher rate of um, risk of cancer, not rate of cancer, may develop um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, breast cancers, and high-grade gliomas, which can be really devastating diagnoses to this population. In order, however, to make a diagnosis of NF1, as I mentioned, you don't necessarily need to see the genetic defect or prove the genetic defect. It can be a clinical diagnosis. In 2021, we revised the criteria just a touch, but having two of the following will render a diagnosis of NF1 in an individual. So most commonly would be the cafeolae macules, having six or more present on the body, and the size of the macule will be determined based on prepubertal versus postpubertal um, age of the patient. Axillary guinal skin fold freckling, leash nodules having at least two or more of these, or choroidal abnormalities, distinct osseous lesions, um, additionally having a first degree relative within, with NF1, optic pathway gliomas, or neurofibromas. And that constitutes just one plexiform neurofibroma or having at least two or more other uh, neurofibromas such as cutaneous or dermal neurofibromas. Ultimately, kids who are, have NF1, I would say adults as well, but kids are diagnosed 70% um, of the time by age one, um, and then 95% of the time by age eight. So definitely seeing these manifestations early in life. These are some nice um, just pictorial representations of what these findings look like. On the top left, you'll see the cafe au lait macules, so a nice um, milk in the coffee coloring, uh, flat skin lesions, and again, the size matters depending on the age of the patient. Often the first sign of NF1 may be present at birth, but can continue to evolve. You may see more as the patient ages, they may become darker as well. But by the age of one year, 80% will have at least the six macules that meet to the diagnostic criteria. It's not a marker of severity at all, and it's present in the vast majority. And then the skin fold freckling, what you see here is the axillary area, so the armpits. Um, so essentially freckles where the, the shun, sun does not shine within that patient, present in about 75% of patients and may evolve a little bit later in life to five to eight years. Again, the other region for skin fold freckling is inguinal around the underwear lines. Looking at the ocular abnormalities, these are the leash nodules that we have. They're mainly seen on a slit lamp examination, so very hard for you to just see in clinic. If we're trying to make a diagnosis of NF1 and we have one manifestation, but we can't see anything else, sometimes we'll refer over to optometry or ophthalmology to evaluate for the presence of leash nodules. Then these choroidal abnormalities that are present in a vast majority of patients with NF1 as well, also asymptomatic, can be found at early ages and the certain techniques used to identify them are as listed. Here on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see imaging of some of the neurofibromas. Um, so dermal neurofibromas are cutaneous neurofibromas, be these little skin out pouchings. Um, not often seen in young children, but as that patient ages and then definitely into adulthood, these evolve over time to the point where you can get hundreds on your skin and be debilitating in their own way. And then an MRI representation of what a cervical and brachial plexus, um, plexiform neurofibroma would look like on imaging. And we'll review a lot more um, kind of imaging representations for neurofibromas as well. Here in the middle, you can see some of the bony abnormalities. So we, we had mentioned kind of the um, pseudoarthritis, but then you have the tibial or fibial dysplasia, as well as the sphenoid wing um, or sphenoidal dysplasia. And then to the right, what an optic pathway glioma. So that optic nerve tract on the right-hand side of our um, screen here is obviously abnormal in comparison to the left. But aside from the main diagnostic criteria, patients who have NF1 can have a kind of head-to-toe um, different uh, disease burden in affecting their organ systems and what we're ultimately going to see. There's a lot of metabolic-related symptoms, skeletal, which we reviewed, but also endocrine and reduced muscle function, um, hypotonia, reduced tone, obviously, can be very common in children. 
neurocog and behavioral impairment. I already mentioned some of the behavioral um, issues that we evaluate for or screen for in a young age. Additionally, patients with NF1 can have headaches and seizures. They can have moya moya, which can complicate the picture and just overall mood disorders. Hearing impairment has been reported, as well as cardiovascular and renal abnormalities. And so in a patient who has NF1, especially those who we treat uh, with certain medications nowadays that have blood pressure abnormalities, we also have to be aware that they're at risk for renal artery stenosis or other things that may kind of predispose them to having higher blood pressures. So making sure the correct and thorough evaluations are done if we start to see clinical toxicity. Then moving forward to the tumors associated with NF1, the top of this list are more low grade, or I'd call them benign tumors. The bottom of the list um, tends to evolve into more malignant or aggressive tumors. But the neurofibroma is obviously a collection of cells or defined as a tumor that can exist with an NF1 being the dermal um, or plexiform. And then the optic pathway gliomas, OPGs, and the other low grade tumors. Then you have malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, which are unfortunately the number one cause of death within this patient population. High-grade gliomas can exist within the brain, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, additionally pheochromocytoma, other peria, gliomas, and rhabdomyosarcoma, which I think is found in about 6% or so of patients with NF1. But really the basics of NF1 plexiform neurofibromas, so honing in on this more benign tumor that can develop, occurs in about 50% or so of patients who have NF1. And as I mentioned, it's typically congenital. So we think that patients are born with um, the plexiforms, but they may grow and evolve as the patient ages and as they obviously advance towards adulthood. We think the growth rate is most rapid in the youngest of children. So under the age of five, there's also been studies that kind of um, use a cutoff of less than eight versus greater than eight years of life to show the growth of the plexiform neurofibromas as well. And what these tumors are are really a collection of cells that have been recruited by, uh, we call it tumorigenic Schwann cells. So the Schwann cell in a patient with NF1 has a heterozygous mutation within NF1. And then that second hit, which makes it homozygous, allows the cell, I would say, to act abnormally and start to recruit friends um, to the playground, more or less. So the Schwann cell will release cytokines. You get this pro-inflammatory response. You get a lot of uh, pro-immune cells that come in, otherwise macrophages, and then you see fibroblasts, and endothelial cells, mast cells vascular development, all these things that kind of intertwine into the tumor microenvironment within a plexiform neurofibroma, and initially due to the um, abnormal mutation within the Schwann cell. These tumors themselves can be highly infiltrated, so they can grow anywhere with where a nerve is located within the body. So you can think of a nerve on the face, you can think of a nerve root coming out of the spinal cord, you can think of something on the extremity, um, really anywhere without uh, within the body. And they're somewhat slow growing tumors in that they're not gonna quickly uh, um, quickly evolve or grow out of their space, but they kind of grow around and through um, some of the vasculature and obviously involving the nerves as well. I don't mean that they're disrupting the vasculature, but sometimes the vasculature will be intertwined within the tumor itself, which you can think would make resection really difficult. They tend to be multinodular. They look like a bag of worms, really hard to measure or discreetly look at when you're doing radiographic imaging. And then they can obstruct major or organs and actually be life-threatening. So even a benign tumor is not always benign. Um, additionally, they can be very disfiguring depending on the location. And so we think about a tumor that may be in the neck and compressing the trachea, leading to airway compromise versus a uh, tumor kind of more superficially on the face that you can't really cover up with clothing and think about the different morbidities that a patient might have just due to those locations. And thinking of the disease burden of NF1PNs, as I mentioned, um, they can definitely cause disfigurement based on the external um, prominence of some of these tumors. Uh, motor dysfunction, the ability to kind of move your arms and your legs, the ability for your bladder and your bowel to function properly, depending on the tumor location. Ability to see, depending if your tumor is kind of obstructing the, the eyelid from opening or if it infiltrates back and is um, involving the optic nerve airway dysfunction, and then a really high morbidity that we see in patients is pain. And sometimes that can be an indication for treatment um, alone without anything else going on. Most patients we know will have uh, more than one plexiform associated um, morbidity. And often this evolves over time. So as the patient ages, their intensity of their morbidities or their number of morbidities may enhance as well. Um, the symptomatic PNs tend to be larger um, than, the, than the smaller ones. It's not always perfect, um, but it also means that not every PN that you see requires treatment because not all of them may be symptomatic. 
And then, as I mentioned, they're quote unquote benign tumors, um, but they do have the chance for malignant transformation throughout the course of a lifetime of somebody who has NF1. And that's found in about eight to 13% of um, individuals. And I'll take you to this slide here because it takes you through what this transformational process would look like due to additional genetic mutations within the cells within that tumor microenvironment. So you see the path of it looks more or less like a benign uh, plexiform neurofibroma and then additional mutations within CDK, N2A, and um, N2B loss leads to formation of an, a new RNA typical neurofibroma is what it used to be called. We call these pre-malignant lesions. Um, here at WashU, we call them ticking time bombs um, needing to be removed because we, we very much worry that these lesions will continue to evolve with additional mutations into a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Now I'll note that these genetic changes do not happen throughout the entirety of a plexiform neurofibroma. So it's often that one portion of the tumor will start to look a little bit different than the rest of it. And then that portion may be what has started to transform. And often patients who have MPNSTs did have a history of a plexiform neurofibroma. And again, it may not be the entire tumor that is abnormal or truly malignant, but a portion of it. And so it's our job to do our best with screening um, from an imaging and a symptomatic standpoint to try to intervene at the earliest stage as possible if we are starting to worry about transformation. Now we'll move over to updates in diagnosis and actual monitoring for PNs, especially as radiology and our techniques have evolved over time. Now I'll admit there's no agreed upon definition um, for the diagnostic considerations, and we all do it a little bit differently. But in general, you do not need a biopsy or a piece of tissue to say that a patient who has NF1 with a tumor that looks like a plexiform on imaging is in fact a plexiform. Um, there have been times where patients who have no known NF1 diagnosis have come to us with a tumor that's resected or a tumor that's been biopsied. And then we try to figure out if there is an underlying NF1 mutation or not. Um, but often we're not biopsying these tumors. It does change a little bit if we're worried about a portion of the tumor of one just isn't acting right or um, looking like the rest of it, then definitely at that time, we very much advocate for tissue and an understanding of what's going on. But otherwise on imaging, they're pretty characteristic. And you've got some nice um, examples here of you know, this boggy bag of worms, a homogeneous uh, characteristic of these tumors and how they are very infiltrative and in what they grow around. And again, how a surgeon would have a really hard time going in and giving you a gross total resection just based on how these tumors ultimately form. For workup and screening considerations, all patients who have NF1 should be assessed for the presence of a plexiform neurofibroma. So we should all be aware that these do develop in this patient population and maybe in about half of the patients with NF1. But it doesn't mean that the first patient you meet with NF1 or a child needs a whole body MRI or anything to evaluate for it, it exists. What you do need to know is if there's something superficially that you see, or if there's an odd symptom that doesn't seem to go away in a child or even an adult or um, mentions of pain, that imaging really is indicated in this patient population to A, identify a plexiform, and B, depending on the age, to see if anything else is really going on. And then we'll continue to use imaging in order to monitor the growth and the evolution of these plexiforms over time. Standard evaluations for an N of one patient, you know, typical physical um, history and physical neuro exam as well. Anything that seems abnormal, um, seems off to you, a bulge that you can feel can definitely proceed to imaging for better identification. And then MRI is by, far, by and far the modality of choice for characterizing these tumors to the best of our ability. We suggest you do it for symptoms that you see. Um, or if there's something external that you see, it may inform treatment approaches. And then the baseline whole body MRI, um, you know, it may be useful uh, when we're transitioning uh, patients from pediatric to adult care. And I say that because the vast majority of plexiforms, as far as we know, exist in childhood um, or before a patient would transition over to adulthood. So at that point, if the patient does not have a known plexiform, doing a crude quick screen with a whole body MRI may help identify if there is one that exists that then requires monitoring as that patient continues to receive care. Because again, as that patient ages the, and if they have a plexiform, that risk for MP and ST continues to heighten. So really understanding the underlying burden can be a benefit. I don't often do whole body MRIs in my very young patients unless we have very nervous families or we're trying to figure out a little bit more about the context of the patient, but we are starting to study the utility of whole body MRIs, but definitely not universally recommended to date.
Then here's just a nice table going through our imaging modalities with the whole body MRI, the localized MRI, surveillance and treatment responses. Different acquisitions are put on here more for the radiologists who might be looking at this um, and through their imaging interpretation and really the main utility. But again, the whole body MRI is not as sophisticated. It's usually done without contrast. It's kind of a head to toe crude evaluation to say, is there something there that shouldn't be there? anatomically. And then usually if we see something, then the recommendation is to get a dedicated MRI. Here at our institution, we do with and without contrast. I'm very well aware that other institutions just do without, um, but just really understanding that diffusion restriction. And if anything in the tumor looks a little bit abnormal, it can be a benefit, at least with our population. And then identifying um, nodular lesions, things within the tumors that seem abnormal um, can be helpful as well. For consideration of imaging modalities, we show the different um, type of modalities that are used, but we have screening, we have surveillance, and then we have treatment response. I would say for the treatment response, so if we have a tumor that we're ultimately using medical therapy, you know, ideally we want to be monitoring that tumor for, um, for change in size or any characteristics that are changing while we're on medication. Usually that interval will be different if the patient's on trial versus just using standard of care, sometimes three to four months up to, I do six months for patients who are on um, targeted inhibition without other major concerns right now. If you're just surveying a plexiform uh, without intervening right now and you don't have any high risk concerns, sometimes just yearly imaging evaluations are, are definitely all that that patient needs. Now, all that being said, um, if you have a known plexiform or even not, and a new symptom emerges, um, in particular, exquisite pain for that patient, definitely doing imaging at that time to make sure that you're not missing anything is of vital importance. All right, moving over to treatment options for NF1PN, which is a really cool time right now, because I'd say in the past four years, um, what we're able to do kind of by ourselves off clinical trials has just, you know, that door has opened greatly. And it's really brought a lot of treatment to patients who otherwise would not be able to receive therapy for their PNs. And so the first question when you have a patient with an NF1PN is, does it even warrant treatment? Um, so not every tumor does, and I want that to be one of the biggest take-home points from today, that the presence of a PN does not mean that that PN necessarily needs treatment. Um, but if we are trying to figure it out a little bit, you can either figure out if observation would be of benefit. Um, so is there not um, a significant morbidity that's associated with the, the tumor? Is the tumor not in a vital location? Um, is the patient... 12 or is the patient two? Obviously um, a two-year-old that has an arm plexiform that might not be causing major issues right now is at risk for pretty, pretty decent growth over the next couple of years. So considering intervention may be a benefit versus a 12-year-old and definitely a 20-year-old where you would expect that growth rate to be a lot different. And then the treatment, what is our goal for treatment? So is the tumor causing anatomic compromise? Is it causing that airway obstruction? Is it causing neurologic or spinal cord issues? Um, then our treatment approach may be drastically different than if the tumor is causing pain or if it's disfiguring and we're trying to shrink it. Um, really understanding our end goals um, is of vital importance. And then really considering what evidence shows and suggests the PN-related um, morbidity or tumor growth with impending morbidity. Um, and so when that patient walks through the door, you know, what are the pros and cons to treatment? Um, a lot of things go into my initial consultations with patients. They tend to take a while because the first question is if the patient needs treatment. And then if we're considering that, that it's a, a possibility, what are all the things that go into what that treatment entails? That takes us to our next slide where we're really debating between surgery versus medical treatment. Those are the main modalities that we have for addressing plexiform neurofibromas. When we think about surgery for plexiforms, um, the vast majority are not going to have a gross total resection, meaning that the surgeon can go in and take out the entirety of the tumor without causing more harm, more neurologic dysfunction, more pain, that kind of thing. But if a tumor is growing in an area that's causing other issues, you know, is taking or resecting part of the tumor, it, would that be beneficial for the patient? So those things kind of go into the initial surgical opinion. And then really understanding is that tumor inoperable or not? It's one of the words that we use um, when we think about then prescribing medical therapy that I know the insurance companies want to see. And as I said, the vast majority of these tumors are going to be inoperable in the sense that you cannot completely resect them. Um, here we quote about 15% of cases can undergo complete tumor excision, but I'll say more and more of the surgeons now are hoping that medical therapy can be used first. Um, and then understanding that if you do debulk the tumor or resect part of it, 
the risk of regrowth is actually pretty high. Um, we quote 43% here, I think in clinical practice, it may be a little bit higher. And I've definitely had patients who've had like an orbital tumor and it's had multiple surgeries or multiple debulkings and the tumor just continues to grow back. And then they're coming to see me to see if there's anything else that can be done. And then again, with surgery, understanding the morbidities of those approaches the medical treatment considerations. Um, when we talk about using a medication, and we'll definitely talk a lot more about the types of medications, we have to understand of how that would change for the life of the patient. So A, the toxicities that exist, what to expect on a medication, how often now that you need to be under medical guidance or medical care, all things that are a little bit different if you are just coming in yearly for your initial evaluations. Um, the biggest thing, though, before starting therapy, especially medical therapy, is to make sure that you're not missing um, malignant transformation or malignancy within the tumor. So if a patient comes to you and all of a sudden they have pain within their plexiform, so they're now coming to you to talk about medical therapy, the first thing we really need to rule out, well, has something changed in that tumor that led to the pain that actually is a lot more concerning than just treating a plexiform neurofibroma in its benign state. Um, it goes without saying that treatment will be very different for a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor versus an NF1 PM. And then considering the overall multidisciplinary care team as we're really thinking about the diverse care aspects. So you have your surgical care team, you have your medical care team, and then you have side effects from medications that can you know, bring in your dermatologist or your cardiologist. Then you have the whole context of a patient who has NF1, which requires a much larger gamut of subspecialists to work with those unique manifestations that we see as well. So it's really not one provider that should be just managing these patients. Ideally, it's a care team, maybe one home provider that has the ability to work with others um, to really communicate the needs for that, for that patient. And it's often that we might initially speak with a surgeon, might think that surgery up front isn't the right decision for that patient. Then we start medical therapy, then we see where things are at. But staying in really close communication can be of vital importance and really benefit the care of those patients. Surgical indications for NF1PN. So sorry to allude to it on prior slides, but if you're having anatomic compromise, so neurologic issues, if you all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but if you have breathing issues, you know, those are reasons to consider going in with a surgical approach first. Relative indications, pain, disfigurement, compromised activities of daily living, those are things where surgery may not always be of benefit. However, there have been cases where, you know, I've been treating a large tumor, a plexiform of the leg, it goes and wraps underneath the foot, it's causing more pain now for the patient as they're walking, and then having them go in and actually get a debulking of that specific area that's causing the most pain while we're also continuing our medical management. So kind of, kind of the, um, the mixed approach and, and working as a team is really important. Understanding the risk of regrowth and obviously the age of the patient, then a lot of unanswered questions remain if we should prophylax early in life with surgery, um, most of us wouldn't recommend it, especially with the risk of regrowth, but could that be beneficial? Could maybe doing surgery and then medication um, reduce that risk of rebound growth or tumor regrowth afterwards? Um, understanding tissue sampling um, is obviously very important as well. And then the main, um, I would say, surgical indications for some of the PNs, and we talked about the airway, neurologic compromise, but really these PNs that are also orbital or periorbital located or in the paraspinal region, potentially causing a neurologic compromise or spinal cord compression, um, which isn't often, by the way, but those where you can um, resect out would be of vital importance. And then moving away from surgery into um, my area of practice as a medical oncologist is looking at targeted medical therapy for NF1 PNs. A lot of drugs were trialed back in the day, especially with our understanding of the genetic mutation of NF1, the aber um, aberrant signaling that can occur because of it. And we've tried to target a lot of different things throughout the days, but it's our most successful um, approach to date has been targeting um, MEK and the MEK inhibition. Um, so overall, what you're seeing here is a diagram of kind of the NF1 mutation where you have a loss of neurofibroma, so that protein, which otherwise is supposed to serve as a stop sign for the cells. And so that stop sign or that stop light is removed and you have this hyperactive um, RAS GTPase that's in motion. And so you have a RAS, RAF, MEK, ERK pathway um, that leads to cell proliferation and survival and growth. And so what's been studied here is MEK inhibition. So introducing that stop sign or that stop light um, more downstream with the pathway. And then we have a variety of MEK inhibitors now that are out. 
um, that have been, as I as I mentioned, very successful. But selumetinib, mirtametinib, binimetinib, trametinib are all listed here. Some other ones like cobimetinib exist, not as well studied within PNs, um, but all kind of targeting that hyperactive pathway. Additionally, we know that tyrosine kinase inhibitors, in particular cabozatinib, um, imatinib, or glufec was also trialed in the past, can be helpful. And how that works is actually inhibiting signaling pathways within the tumor microenvironment. So less on this hyperactive pathway and more on saying, hey, Schwann cell, don't communicate with the mast cell because I'm inhibiting CKIT. Um, don't um, get neoangiogenesis because we're going to target VEGFR2. Those kind of hits that can help as well. To date, selumetinib is the only MEK inhibitor that's approved um, for the treatment of pediatrics, um, so patients 2 to 18 who have that inoperable symptomatic PN. So that's why I keep saying what is inoperable, and the vast majority of these are going to be. Um, selumetinib right now is a pill. Um, it's given BID um, as an oral capsule, so the patient has to be able to swallow it. This is a nice um, report from the ESMO paper, um, just looking at comparison um, treatment responses between some of our medical therapy that we have to date. And so you'll see here on the y-axis, the partial response. Um, and what that means is when a patient enters the clinical trial, their tumor is measured and you're given usually a milliliter um, volumetric measurement, especially for these clinical trials, which is a very sophisticated uh, radiologist that provides those measurements. And then as the patient continues on study and is taking the medication, we see, is the tumor shrinking? Is the tumor growing? What is that milliliter change? And then that leads to a percent change from baseline. Uh, for plexiform neurofibroma studies, uh, we noted a decrease of 20% change. So 20% reduction in tumor size as being a partial response where everything between zero to 20% uh, growth is stable disease. So negative 20 to 20 um, and then anything that grows beyond 20% would be a progressive disease. And then here you can see the partial response rate. So for those patients who are on study who had a tumor decrease by more than 20%, how often that, did that occur? And then the selumetinib studies, those were the earlier sprint trials, uh, were quoted at about 70% or so of kids um, who had PNs that they shrunk by more than 20%. Then that's in comparison to trametinib and bin binimetinib, as well as mirinimetinib in both the pediatric adult population. And then on the far right is an adult study with cabozatinib. We're getting ready to get our uh, pediatric data published soon as well. I think it's helpful to kind of see these comparisons, but I do advise caution from comparing one MEK inhibitor to the next. Um, I think the patients are all unique and diverse. I think these measurements can be a little bit difficult sometimes um, to quantify. Um, so I'm not sure that we all think that one is drastically better than the other, but I know to date, um, we, the vast majority of us will use the FDA approved um, MEK inhibitor. When we are using MEK inhibitors, however, um, monitoring for toxicities is of vital importance. A lot of these toxicities can be seen with clinical exam and just talking to the patient. So commonly in both pediatrics and adult, you can get rashes um, more in adults and adolescents of really bad acneiform rash. In kids, more maybe the dry skin or eczema. Um, you're going to get nail bed changes um, of the fingers and the toes uh, with parenchyma. Um, you'll definitely see maybe some slight lab abnormalities, creatinine kinase in particular. It's usually asymptomatic, um, but you'll see some fluctuations. Decrease in left ventricular ejection fraction is commonly reported. And so based on all these side effects that we know about, kind of goes into what our monitoring is, especially off-label. Physical exam is helpful. Talking to the patient, obviously always helpful. Um, whenever we start a new medication, we tend to do monthly evaluations. Then if that patient is doing well, we're able to spread those out a touch more. Um, eye exams um, at baseline. And then I think the frequency varies from institution to institution. We'll do it usually at three months and then yearly. Um, and what we're really looking for is like retinal vein occlusion, retinal detachments, things that have been reported with MEK inhibitors. But I'll admit that we haven't really seen them, at least in our pediatric population, who's using MEK inhibitors for PNs. Um, and I've talked to quite a few people um, throughout the nation about that as well. Obviously, if you're having blurry visions or new symptoms, you would want to get checked though. The um, decrease in injection fraction, however, it's usually asymptomatic. Um, I do see that commonly occur within our patient population. So getting an echo at baseline to have your baseline EF is very important. And then monitoring in three to six month intervals. I'll do the first three months um, in the initial year for a patient and then spread it out to six months as needed. You know, my adult colleague tends to stick with six months. So again, a little bit of variation of practice throughout. 
um, EKGs, pregnancy tests, um, obviously uh, for, for reasons that are well known to everybody, and then lab examinations. So at baseline, you know, here it reports every three to six months. Uh, we tend to do monthly for a little bit until we're, we're sure that things are, are moving in the right direction. Um, but then, of course, if you see an elevation like in creatinine kinase um, and we're thinking about dose mods or if you just have a grade one or even a grade two, you know, we'll do those um, those checks a little bit more frequently. All right, now we've hit uh, the fourth bullet point, which is recent practice changing evidence within um, NF1 PNs. And I'd say, you know, really the landmark studies which led to the FDA approval um, for a drug started um, through the NIH and with the SPRINT trials. And what I'll report here is a phase two um, trial with a SPRINT, which is open label. Kids that could be enrolled were age two to 18, so the pediatric population. They had to have a symptomatic inoperable PN. And what that means is that the PN was disfiguring, that it caused pain, that it caused bladder or bowel issues, that it maybe caused airway issues, but obviously not enough to where you didn't need surgical intervention initially. And additionally, progressive tumors um, usually are eligible for enrollment on studies as well. And then no evidence of active malignancy um, is always an exclusion criteria for any study where you're um, coming in with targeted inhibition or treatment effects. The cellulometum dosing um, was 25 milligrams per meter squared um, based on BSA, um, given twice daily. And in their initial study, they had 50 patients. Of note, um, this is continuous dosing. Each treatment cycle or cycles for 28 days. There's no break in between cycles. Um, and patients could stay on drug for up to two years if not having a, a major drug-related toxicity. So obviously those are graded with those mods appropriately. Um, or progressive disease, which I mentioned was a greater than 20% increase in the tumor volume. The primary endpoint for this study was partial response, uh, which you'll see through a lot of these studies. So a greater than 20% reduction, which was confirmed and then looking if it was durable. So if you had a partial response, it actually last on study. And then second in, um, end, uh, second endpoints for the duration of response, safety, and then patient observer reported outcomes. And that I find actually extremely helpful. Um, more for the real world, because a lot of our radiologists aren't able to give us volumetric measurements to give me a 22% or an 18% or a 30% change in tumor volume. So does the tumor look like it's growing or maybe shrinking? Uh, most of the time we're going to hear stable from our radiologist, but am I helping the patient otherwise? Um, did they come in with pain and do they have less pain? Um, was there a vision issue now they can maybe open their eye a little bit more? Um, you know, walking long distances, couldn't do before, but now we can. Um, really functional things that can be very helpful for us. And then here we're looking at the SPRINT trial on the three-year outcomes with cellumetinib. And overall, there was 74% that was quoted as having a partial response um, with a confidence interval between 60 and 85%. Then the confirmed and durable responses were uh, 68 and 56% um, percent, uh, respectively. Time to response is eight to 16 cycles. Um, and I think that that's actually um, very important to note. So the initial um, time to response was eight cycles and then the best response was 16. So what that means is a patient is on med for, I don't know, maybe eight months before we're identifying that initial uh, response. And I always tell patients, you might start this, but you're not gonna see an effect overnight. So to be really careful with what our expectations are. And if you're tolerating the med okay, can you wait it out six months for our first set of evaluations? If we don't see much change in six months, um, but I'm impacting other symptoms, those kind of things will go into a continuation of therapy. But also to know that the depth of the response may increase as patients stay on study um, or on drug for that case. And then here um, in our line graph, you're looking at progression-free survival. And this is in comparison to the natural history study. So for three years of therapy, um, your natural history PFS is, is just 15%, so really dismal. But for kids who are on uh, MEC inhibition, that's 84% on study, so pretty neat. Additionally, the median change in the tumor volume was 28%, um, so above that 20% threshold, but that about 28% reduction was on average what we were seeing. And then a lot of cleanful, meaningful decreases in pain of 74% for those who came in with it, so out of 19 
some degree in improvement in other complications, um, I'd say about 70%, so seven in 10, and then improvements in function and quality of life. And all this um, for somebody that's off study goes into how we manage these patients. How are we benefiting their lives being on med? Are we making it worse by being on med due to the toxicities that they, that they see? Or are we making something better? And if we're making something better, how can we keep trying to do that, especially within the pediatric population? And importantly, I think the safety outcomes are really helpful. So how um, toxic are these meds? How often do we see these toxicities and what to expect when you are prescribing them? GI side effects, very common, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, the asymptomatic increase in CK, acneiform rash, um, bronchia, uh, adverse events that led to dose reduction. So it happened in about 30% of patients, right? Um, it's pretty substantial, I think, when we're um, debating how we're dosing this medication. So 14 out of 50, then five that were due to drug-related adverse events. And then in this study, reason for treatment discontinuation. So they had progressive disease, um, adverse events that occurred or for other reasons. And then moving on from the combined data for the phase one, two trials that looks up to five-year outcomes of selumetinib um, in children with inoperable PNs. And then this combined cohort, we have 74 patients, continuous selumetinib dosing over a large number of cycles. And then who, those who remain on, uh, on treatment at data cutoff were 31 patients. Um, about 70 had confirmed partial response and 59% of these were durable. So sometimes you can have a partial response so that tumor shrinks nicely, but then on subsequent scans, you might see um, tumor regrowth um, even on medication. Then again, that time to response um, can take a little bit to actually see as well as that best response. Uh, median progression-free survival is up to seven years. So that's pretty cool. And then a one-year probability of being progression-free after 60 cycles was at 61%. Moving forward to the RENEW study, so this is with mirtametinib. Um, they did both a pediatric and adult cohort. Pediatric for them was 2 to 17, and adults were 18 and greater. Same indications for treatment, so NF1, progressive or symptomatic, and operable PM. And then mirtametinib dosing, I think importantly to note that there was one week off. So uh, 2 milligrams per meter square BID um, given three weeks on, so 21 days in a row, and then a seven-day off period where you're not receiving any medications. And then these cycles were 28 days in total and then continuous for up to two years. Similar primary endpoints, looking at partial response and then secondary, the duration of response, uh, safety, quality of life and physical functioning. So very common themes that we're gonna see amongst our studies. Here with meritometinib, median duration of treatment was 22 months for both the pediatric and the adult cohort. Um, treatment related adverse events that led um, to dose interruption in kids happened in about 30%. Dose reduction in kids was 13% and discontinuation was 9%. That's in comparison to the adult population that had about 31% of dose interruption, 17% reduction, but then a discontinuation in 22%. Then looking at the most common um, treatment related AEs, TRAEs, um, that happened in more than 35% of patients. In kids, you'll see the diarrhea, the vomiting, so GI side effects, and then derma, um, the acneiform rash, and then adults, again, this acneiform rash and GI side effects, all major reasons. I've heard sometimes that that um, seven-day off window can sometimes change the side effect profile for patients because their bodies sometimes get used to taking the med, and then the time period when they're off of it can be a little bit different. Um, and I think that's going to be further studied um, within that um, within the group. And then key outcomes, I'm um, looking at the tumor response. So in kids, 52% uh, with a partial response. Um, and then in the adults, 41%. The duration of response was not reached. I can tell you most people that had response, it was continued for their period of evaluation. Changing tumor volume was a little bit deeper than the 28% that we were talking about with selumetinib. Again, these numbers are not perfect. So doing a head-to-head -head comparison is very difficult. But the um, percent reduction here in mirtametinib was closer to 42 and 41%. And then when we look for the time to first response, you'll see at 7.9 and 7.8 months. But I think what's really interesting to note is on clinical trials, you're getting these imagings at four months and then at eight months and 12 months. So sometimes hard for us to pick it up a little bit earlier. But just to know it does take some time of being on medication in order to see um, an actual response. Then moving over to binimetinib, which is a MEC1-2 inhibitor, um, we have the NF108 and the PNOC10 trial ongoing phase two open label. Um, it was administered in both pediatric um, and adults with the ages listed here, and then same exact indications. 
Now, being a matinib is continuous in kids. It was 32 milligrams per meter square the, at the starting dose given BID. In adults, were 45 milligrams BID, 28 day cycles, no rest in between. Those who had a partial response at 12 months, so a 20% reduction could continue it for up to two years. And there were some patients I know, at least within the NF clinical trials consortium, <clears throat> that may have stayed on like expanded access. But the primary endpoints for these studies, again, partial response, looking at it at 12 months, and then overall understanding the safety profile for the medication. So with bidimetinib, um, partial response was 74% um, in patients um, from the pediatric side, so 19 patients, 14 were able to get that greater than 20% reduction. So that's, again, hard to do head-to-head, -head, but maybe somewhat comparable to the selumetinib. The medium maximal plexiform neurofibroma volume change was 26%, uh, which again is what uh, was kind of reported with uh, selumetinib, ranged from 9% to 54%. 13, however, uh, required dose reduction, so 13 out of 19 patients. And then looking at safety, we have two patients that discontinued due to dose toxicity. And then grade three toxicities um, existed within this population, being dry skin, weight gain, muscle weakness, rash, um, paronchia, cellulitis, diarrhea, gastric hemorrhage, and CK increase. All right, and now switching gears, um, after we talked about the various MAC inhibitors that have been trialed, look at the data from cabozapnib which again, as I mentioned, was a multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor where the goal is really inhibiting communication within the tumor microenvironment of a PM. So we have data um, from the adult cohort of NF105 uh, using cabozatinib. We had a pediatric cohort as well. That data is just not yet published. For adolescents and adults 16 years of age or greater, same requirements of having an inoperable NF1-related PM that cause symptoms, morbidity, um, or were progressive, were eligible for study, and no evidence of a malignancy that required treatment. Cabozatinib itself um, was dosed daily. I was dosed in 21 patients initially, where we could evaluate for safety analysis. And the dosing was 40 milligrams set dose for the first two cycles within this patient population, that after two cycles could be dose escalated to 60 milligrams per day thereafter. Each treatment cycle was six uh, was 28 days, and it was continuous. And then this medication, uh, again, is a once-daily daily dose. Patients could continue up to two years, um, but here there was a unique stopping rule that if by the end of cycle eight, there was not a 15% volume reduction in the target PN, the patient had to come off study. Um, by the end of cycle 12, there was not a partial response. The patient also had to come off study. And the goal is really to try to reduce exposure, or potential side effects to patients if we didn't feel like it was going to be effective for that population. A uh, primary endpoint here was a partial response in 25% of patients after 12 cycles was the benchmark of what we were trying to achieve. And then key secondary endpoints being tolerability and safety, and really understanding about, you know, type cabozatinib within this population, as well as patient reported outcomes, pain, and quality of life. What we found um, for the 19 patients who were valuable for response, again, the 21 patients who initially started, not all were valuable, but eight out of the 19 or 42% had a partial response or greater than a 20% reduction in tumor volume. Additionally, 58% um, had um, ultimately stable disease, um, which could be helpful depending on um, the progressive nature of these tumors coming in. The median plexiform neurofibroma volume, Jane Chow, was 16%, which ranged from three to 38%. Seven patients required a dose reduction and greater, um, and the most common adverse events that were found in greater than 10 patients um, or equal to 10 patients included diarrhea, nausea, and asymptomatic hypothyroidism. So an interesting um, side effect that's actually well known by exolipsis and the use of cabozatinib, but patients did have to start some thyroid or thyroid supplementation in addition to um, fatigue and then um, this unique rash on the palms of the hand and the feet, while palmar plantar erythrodysesia, which can be actually extremely painful and sometimes we prophylaxed against. Patient disposition during study, uh, five patients completed all cycles. Um, there were six who ultimately had to stop at cycle eight due to the, the stopping rule of not having greater than a 15% reduction. And then those who discontinued due to dose limiting uh, toxicity included two patients and then six with low grade adverse events. Once I, one thing I will say before um, I move on to our next slide is that this population of NF1 patients who have had PNs have been dealing with their PNs throughout their lifetime, especially when we're treating adult patients. 
Um, and so really understanding some of the toxicities from these medications versus how toxic the tumor is to them is a really interesting dynamic to see. And I feel that some of these side effects that could maybe be more tolerable in a patient with a more, I would say, aggressive or malignant condition to where if they weren't treated, something bad would happen. In this patient population, really understanding the risk benefit ratio, I think can be very beneficial um, for understanding treatment approaches. And then investigational agents for PN, um, looking at trametinib now. So we did a couple of our MEK inhibitors. We went to cabozatinib, and now we're back to trametinib, which is another MEK-1-2 inhibitor. There are FDA-approved med- um, indications for trametinib. PN is not on the list, but melanoma, advanced non cell, lung cancer, subsets of thyroid cancer. It's obviously um, for some of us who treat a variety of malignancies, often combined with dibrafenib, um, B600 E mutations. And NF1 associated PNs, there was a trametinib that was used in a case series report um, with six patients and also in a phase one, two, a dose escalation trial. Um, and so for patients um, who are on this particular trial, they were aged one month to 18, um, to, could be aged one month to less than 18 years with a median age of six years. Um, and to be eligible, have medically significant unresectable NF1-associated PN, so that inoperable. And based on interim analysis here, you can see that partial response occurred in 46% of those patients over a median duration of exposure of over 408 days, so over a year. And then the most common treatment-related AEs here with trametinib um, included rash and parenchia um, as well. I think that the data that we have at hand is really helpful. I think um, understanding which drug to use can be very difficult. Um, Sometimes working with the FDA and understanding what's been FDA approved, what insurance will cover, what formulation makes sense. Um, You know, the toxicity profiles we think may be similar, but some may be a little bit more with one drug versus the other. Um, All those things go into consideration when we're prescribing for our patient populations. Um, But there are still obviously a lot of remaining treatment related questions. Um, What is the impact of natural history growth and development of the PN? Um, And are we inhibiting it by using our medications? And what happens also when medications are stopped or as the patient ages? Um, the impact on malignant transformation, it's been documented that patients who are on the SPRINT trial, who are on cellumatinib, um, I think there were two patients, if I'm correct, who developed MPNST. So we know that being on MEK inhibition uh, regularly won't necessarily prevent that transformation that, from happening, but does it get in the way of it some, or does there some therapeutic resistance, that's resistance that develops that could be problems some later, we just don't know yet. The optimal treatment duration may be different in the two-year-old versus a 10-year-old versus a uh, 20-year-old. And when is treatment con- uh, discontinuation possible? I think we could speak hours about these type of topics. And uh, again, each patient is unique. And so those decision points need to be tailored to the patient. Length of therapy to stay sustain the clinical benefit. Um, I'll see in kids, usually if I'm using um, medical therapy for pain, um, that When they come off the medication, often the pain returns, not just the rebound, but a little bit more chronic versus one of my adult colleagues seems that, you know, she'll use it for about two years if it's for um, some indications, including pain. And then sometimes that's all the patient actually needs in order to come off. So maybe a little bit different biology, depending on the age. Then really better um, defining efficacy. I think these volumetric responses are hard. Knowing who's going to respond is hard because there will be circulating biomarkers that we can measure that might help us determine um, who would benefit from these type of therapies, all things that are being studied a little bit, but we don't quite know yet. And then long-term safety, that's the hardest one, especially for those who treat a pediatric population. What am I doing now that's going to impact this patient 30 years from now? And if there's on these drugs for 10 years, is that problematic? One year, um, trying to consider these things. Role of medical therapy with surgery, optimal sequence. So could you do a debulking and then start therapy to prevent regrowth? That's definitely something that we think about and then sometimes done in patients, but we just don't have clear cut data for it. Potential of other MEK inhibitors in treatment resistant patients. So if one patient failed a MEK inhibitor, will they respond to another? Um, I'll leave that as an open question right now. I think we all have have some thoughts, um, but it's not necessarily concrete that that would occur. Appropriate duration of follow-up and monitoring procedures. As I mentioned when I was going through the prior table, you know, the frequency in which we'll get some of these evaluations may differ from institution to institution, especially when the patient's off study, that impact on psychiatric conditions and quality of life, which really should be at the top of the list. So understanding the patient as a whole as we're trying to treat them. And lastly, I'll try to close up here with just a few clinical case scenarios to integrate new developments. So Hopefully we still have your attention um, and we'll be close to to wrapping things up. 
Um, before we get to an actual case, this is just um, a nice figure of uh, the thought process that goes into our treatment recommendations for patients. And so just at the top here, you found a PN um, in an N of one patient. Are there symptoms? Are there not? If there's no symptoms, then definitely consider observation, right? Um, if there are symptoms or if there is organ compromise or potential organ compromise, um, then maybe we should think about um, if, if, if intervention is warranted for that patient. And then it goes to where is that tumor located? Is it the head and the face, the neck, the chest, the belly, the pelvis, the extremity, the spinal cord? All those locations will have different people that will weigh in, different surgeons, different symptoms that you may have, different care teams that are involved. So really, again, kind of developing these relationships and communication with a variety of people um, that can become more expert um, in NF1 care is of vital importance. And then when we have the right team, we have the right organ system, we kind of know what we're addressing, is complete surgical resection possible? Um, or do you have active organ dysfunction or do we have pending active organ dysfunction? If any of these are potential yes, then consider surgical resection. Um, we understand, again, the risks of regrowth and things like that. But if that could maybe solve the problem, um, it would be more immediate um, and then it might be more permanent. And then if the answer is no to those, then that's when we start to consider um, our targeted therapies. So here we'll get to our first case, which is a three-year-old female. She's got a lot of pain in the left upper arm. Um, and then we ultimately found to have um, an NF1 plux from neurofibroma that's located located there. It has been rapidly growing. There's some swelling in the arm, but movement does not appear, um, appear to be overall impacted. And the quick backstory for her is that um, NF1 was diagnosed based on family history. So obviously a parent um, who had NF1 and had a heightened alert probably for the child. Um, and then the patient also had capillary macules. So those two things alone render a diagnosis, and then you have the plaxiform as well. So now you have three components, um, no prior surgeries um, or medical interventions to date. And so here's just some MRI evaluation for, for what this patient looks like at the age of three. And the question is, which, um, which management option would you consider? Do you just continue to monitor the patient? Uh, maybe have them come back in a year with repeat imaging? Do you initiate uh, MEK inhibitor therapy, um, no type of surgery at this time, or do you plan for tumor resection or maybe even debulking um, um, as well? And if you take a look at these MRIs, uh, you can see that the tumor is very infiltrative. Um, I'm just looking at it and I could say that a complete total resection is just does not look feasible at all to me. I imagine that, um, you know, our our orthopedic surgeon who works with extremities would probably agree. So we probably take surgery off the table. Um, is there one area that's concerning or not? Um, most likely the imaging didn't show us that. So it's probably just a diffuse issue, but it seems like the tumor causes pain. Additionally, the patient's three. Um, and so the likelihood that this tumor could progress and grow as the patient gets older is, is pretty high. Um, so this is definitely a patient where I would consider intervention with medical therapy, um, with MEK inhibition in particular. Um, then the next question is, can a three-year-old swallow pills? And then that would go into my decision-making for what's ultimately prescribed. Um, but a great candidate for a young patient who's symptomatic, who could be um, at risk for worsening symptoms and decreased quality of life um, if that tumor grows through the lifetime, or maybe intervene, intervening at this age could be helpful. And then the next question, which isn't on the slide, but let's say you do start with you stop, and that would don't have a great time frame from. So if we are helping, if the tumor is not growing through our mechanobition, if the pain is relieved, if the toxicities are tolerable, if kind of coming to and from um, a tertiary care center, wherever that management is happening is okay for the family. Those are all reasons to potentially continue. And then we'll move over to an 11-year-old male. So different location, obviously, again, these PNs can be anywhere. They can also look a little bit different, um, but this is uh, a true case. And this is what the MRI imaging had looked like. Um, so the 11-year-old who had NF1 also diagnosed on family history, he additionally had capillary macules, uh, plexiform neurofibroma, and leash nodules. Those were ultimately referred for consultation. Um, so what had happened is that um, the family noticed a bump on his neck um, and underneath his kind of mandible. It didn't really hurt him at all, wasn't painful when moving the neck or anything like that. And so it was ultimately imaged. Um, had never had any type of intervention before as far as surgery or medical management. Um, but after the initial image, follow-up imaging occurred, um, which ultimately showed an increase in size in the mass. And so the next question is, what do you, uh, what do, you do at that time? And so we didn't spend a ton of time on malignant transformation, um, but anytime you have a growing tumor in a patient, um, 
you know, a little bit less likely as pain was not um, a big fa a big factor for him. But a PET scan is an easy non-invasive test to do. And that's what this patient ultimately underwent. And it showed that this tumor is actually pretty cool, the SUV max of two. Um, we were able to measure it pretty well. Um, but while it had, had grown some, um, the uh, avidity of the tumor was not bright. So um, at this time, biopsy of the mass was not recommended. Um, I will say though that PET scans aren't always perfect. Um, there have been times when things that have been cold um, within plexiform end up actually being malignant while things that have been hot are just benign. Um, so just kind of understanding the, the limitations of these evaluations. Um, and then I'll also add real quick that if there is any level of concern, biopsy is very helpful, especially if it's directed to the level of concern, but these tumors are very heterogeneous, um, but understanding um, what type of approach should be taken if it's biopsy, if it's just kind of a quick resection to remove an atypical neurofibroma, or if you need a real oncologic resection for an MPNST, all things are, all of these things are really helpful with imaging and tissue. But in this particular case, so you have a growing tumor, he's now 11, the PET scan was overall reassuring, um, presented his case at some of our tumor boards, nobody really raised any red flags, um, we didn't feel like tissue had to be obtained. And the question is, um, he wasn't really a candidate for surgical intervention, but what would you actually consider? Um, so you have a growing tumor, um, would you actually treat it or would you monitor him? As I said, um, sampling definitely could have occurred. I don't think anybody would have um, been faulted if tissue would have been obtained and it could be in the in the future, depending on the, the what this tumor is to do that we consider it. Um, but really the question is, do you treat with medical therapy, um, understanding from the surgical perspective that this is pretty inoperable in the carotid space right now to get the entirety removed. Um, and in his scenario, um, in meeting and discussing in depth with radiology, they said, hey, even if this thing grows a little bit more, it's actually not gonna cause them any problems at all. There's a lot of space in that area. Um, and when the family heard that, and they also heard of the side effects of medications, um, and the kid otherwise completely asymptomatic, we decided to do close observation, and that's what will continue. And then lastly, we have an 18-year-old patient, and this is a patient who presents with recurrent uh, tumor mass and pain. And then first starting with her backstory, she was diagnosed with NF1 at age 11, uh, caffeolae, macules, pseudoarthritis, cutaneous neurofibromas, and one plexiform neurofibroma. Then at the time she had a brain MRI that revealed a mass in the posterior scalp, um, and then also in the right peri um, parieto occipital region without any other uh, brain or optic nerve abnormalities. At the age of 15, she underwent the bulking surgery and the uh, anatomic pathology is indicated here, which showed a plexiform neurofibroma. So that was three years prior of the surgical debulking for symptom relief. Um, she had a tumor mass in the posterior scalp um, and in that region, which I already indicated, and that's what she looked like post-op. But now she's coming in with recurrent tumor mass and pain. <clears throat> the MRI um, is showing um, reappearance of lesion that was in the same location. I apologize that we don't have those images here. The mass is smaller than at the time of initial debulking. And the question is what to do. So you already debulked, um, that was a couple of years ago, and now you're back with a uh, uh, recurrence of the lesion, which I said can occur in about 50% of patients um, and potentially painful for that patient. Um, so do you consider a tumor resection? Um, do you debulk again? Do you initiate medical therapy? Do you combine tumor resection with medical therapy? Um, all of these options can be on the table. Um, the question is how easy is a surgery? How um, lack of morbidity, uh, what it entail? And that's one question. If we, hey, it's considered, hey, let's debulk again um, or resect what we can, but maybe this time let's trial mech inhibition um, to see if that prevents regrowth over a few years, that could be an option. Or if she says, I really want to avoid surgery this time around, then we could consider medical options. I think in something that's more superficial and that's already undergone surgery and now it's back, that treatment decision looks a little bit different. Um, but I'd say if we ever lean towards the debulking again, that potentially trialing some uh, medication to prevent regrowth would definitely be at the top of my list. And then overall, in conclusion, and we've you know we've made it towards the end, which is great. Um, but plexiform neurofibromas develop in up to fifty percent of patients with NF one, and are typically congenital or um, manifest in early childhood. Um, so again, when you're 20 and 30, we wouldn't expect necessarily a new, a new plexiform to occur. They're asymptomatic and um, symptomatic PNs that can often coexist in the same individual. And so one is not like the other. The growth rate of a PN will vary between tumors across individuals and obviously across age ranges, which we talked a lot about. 
most patients will have greater than one um, or one associated morbidity that can worsen over time without treatment. And again, these are benign tumors, but there's about a 10% risk of malignant transformation throughout the lifetime of somebody who has an NF1 associated PM. There's no agreed upon definition of a PN. A lot of us will just base this clinically and radiographically. Imaging plays a vital role in the management as far as surveillance, um, monitoring, initial diagnosis, and then when on treatment. Careful selection of treatment versus observation is really, really important to benefit, um, to maximize the benefit and obviously minimize the risk for that patient. Then surgical versus medical management should be in, uh, evaluated and really input from the multidisciplinary team. So understanding and working with a surgeon that has some expertise within NF1 and PMs can be a benefit to really figure out what options are on the table. Then decision re regarding um, indications for and the scope of surgery need to be tailored um, to a lot of different things that we've already talked about. Um, but big things to um, put as far as a, a discussion, and sometimes these appointments are definitely not just 15 minutes, but really going through our treatment options. And now I'd like to mention that, um, you know, this will allow you guys to get CME credit um, by listening through the lecture to the end and to return to the activity page for the neurofibromatosis type 1 related PNs, improving diagnosis and monitoring while integrating ongoing updates and treatment continuum. Um, here's the, the website. You just have to click claim uh, credit button associated with the activity, do a quick post-test and evaluation, and then uh, upon successful completion of the post-test, <clears throat> the certificate will be emailed to you. And then please visit us at this website to review other archive presentations of interest and receive additional um, accredited continuing education credit. And here is a QR code um, to scan if that's any easier for you guys. Um, this website's also um, part of the mobile app. And just really great to be able to meet with you, obviously, all virtually um, and be able to provide some additional information about this content. Thanks. We hope you found this podcast useful and educational. To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please go to the activity page at practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.